Hello, I'm Dominic Gallagher, and this video is going to be about hydrogen gas. So, I made a project here to produce hydrogen gas using electricity, and you might have heard about this idea of using hydrogen as a fuel source and wondered what it's all about. We'll take this as an example. In this slide, you can see that in 2018, in my part of Ireland, 10% of the wind energy went to waste. It couldn't be used because there was too much of it on the grid at once. And this next slide shows that about, according to ElectroRoot, 7% of the time, the electricity price was actually less than zero. So this shows us that there could be a huge potential if someone finds a way to economically turn this electricity into hydrogen gas and use the hydrogen gas for some sort of useful purpose. I started off with the design for the cell. Originally I wanted the output to be about one kilowatt but this would have been very expensive. So I decided to make a cell with a smaller output and I can upgrade this later if I need to. This is the design for the cell that I finally came up with. So here's how it works. At the core of the cell are these two electrodes and between them is a sodium hydroxide solution. The electricity passes from one electrode to the other and when it does this it splits the water in between into hydrogen at one side and oxygen at the other side. The two gases can never combine. Say the hydrogen is here, it must go up into this channel and can pass through these holes. The oxygen is formed in here, it can pass through this part, but never mix with the hydrogen. It must go through this series of holes here. We've got, in this example, five rubber gaskets. They keep the whole thing sealed so that the solution of electrolyte can only stay inside the cell. And these two membranes are so that the gases cannot mix by crossing through here. Finally, these are the polypropylene end plates and they squeeze the whole thing together under high pressure so that there can be no leaks. Without a cooling system, this whole thing could overheat and the water inside the cell would boil and we don't want that. So I've got these two holes here drilled so that water can pass through into this area behind the first electrode and out the other side and then I've got a tube connecting it around here and it does the same over here. This means there's a constant flow of water behind each electrode and this keeps the whole thing cool. Now one more thing about this design, this isn't exactly how I made my final cell. I actually used three electrodes but it works exactly the same way. We've just got extra gaskets and extra membranes to keep the gases separate. Once I had my plans ready, I started to order the parts. So here you can see I'm getting the electrodes from the cell. They're made from pure nickel metal. These boxes will hold the electrolyte solution supply for the cell. They're made from polypropylene plastic. And I also needed a few specialist tools, such as these 15 mm drill bits. Once all the parts arrived, I started making the actual cell. So the first thing I did was I covered the polypropylene end tapes with masking tape. This was so that I was able to write on them. I marked them out, drilled the holes and you can see me here tapping some of the holes. I did the same thing with the nickel electrodes. They were much simpler, I just marked them out and drilled them. Here you can see me cutting some a sheet of three millimeter EPDM rubber to make the gaskets. Not every type of rubber will work for this, but butyl rubber, natural rubber and EPDM should work. I also marked out these 200 millimeter by 170 meter piece of millimeter pieces of rubber and try to get them as accurate as I could so that there would be no gaps or leaks. I used a ruler to give a nice clean straight edge whenever I could. This is a homemade 13 millimeter punch because you can't really drill a hole directly into rubber, it needs to be punched. I'm using a piece of polycarbonate beneath the punch so that it doesn't get dull. I made the punch by taking an ordinary piece of steel pipe, sharpening the end of it 
and then hardening it by heating it up with a blowtorch and dropping it into cold water. And there's the finished gasket. Once I had made all the parts, I took the plumbing fittings that I bought and screwed them into the holes. Unfortunately, I made the mistake of not using any PTFE tape originally, so I had to take everything apart, put PTFE tape on the threads, and put it all back together because I got some leaks originally. I used silicone hose to connect everything together and I'm very happy with my choice because it's easy to cut and work with and it's easy to bend and it doesn't get kinks in it easily. Next, I assembled the cell using 18 stainless steel screws. I built a frame to support the electrolyte tanks and to make the electrolyte I dissolved sodium hydroxide into water. You can buy sodium hydroxide as caustic soda drain cleaner. So let's see the cell in operation now. This here is our power supply. It's actually a DC welder, but all it does is it provides positive current here and negative at the back. These go into these strips of copper which carry the current down to the nickel electrodes. Got one at the front here, one at the back. The current flows between the nickel electrodes and passes through some membranes. The membranes let the current through, they don't let the gases through. So that allows us to separate the oxygen up on this side and the hydrogen up on this side. This cell can generate a lot of heat if you're driving it hard, if you're putting a lot of electricity and making a lot of hydrogen. That's why we need a cooling system to stop it from overheating. So this is our cold water coming in, goes into the back of the cell, flows past the electrode at the back and then it comes through here to the front of the cell and flows past the electrode at the front and eventually comes out here and down to the drain. This keeps the whole system cool and when the cell is running you'll see that the bubbles are constantly rising up here and the water is constantly flowing back down into the cell. So you've got this constant recirculation of water and that keeps the whole thing at a homogeneous and a reasonably low temperature. So I suppose you want to see it in action. Let's go. We'll turn on this power supply here. First we'll put on some goggles just in case. There you go. So we've got about 40 amps here. Now we're going to have twice as much hydrogen as oxygen because water is two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. Now just to do a demonstration that this is actually oxygen coming out of here. If I take this little splint of wood and light it on fire, kind of hard to light. What I'm going to try to do here is once I get this burning, I'm going to put out the flame and because oxygen allows things to burn so well, the oxygen will relight this even though I've blown it out. So here we go, that's it, it's blowing out, but if I put it here, you can see it lights again. Do that again, blow it out, and put it here, and it lights again. One more time. There you go. Oxygen makes things burn really well. The other thing is, and let's turn up the power a little bit for this. Hydrogen itself burns very well. So we've got hydrogen coming up here, down through this tube into the metal tube, and coming out this end. So if I light this on fire, you see. So as you can see, the, we've got the hydrogen gas coming down through this tube and it's burning well. We've got a very orange colored flame. That's because we've got sodium hydroxide up in here and some of the ions of the sodium ions are getting carried down and that's what gives the flame the orange color. It's the exact same color as a sodium street light and that's no coincidence. Here I'm collecting some hydrogen gas in a bag above the electrolyzer. One of the well-known properties of hydrogen gas is that it's much lighter than air. That's why the bag rises up and when I tie it to a string it tries to rise towards the sky. It's also flammable as you can see here. Now one of the big topics around hydrogen gas is storage. Storage of hydrogen is pretty tricky. You can compress it into a bottle, 
but it takes a huge amount of pressure to get a significant amount of gas inside the bottle. I've got a few atmospheres here and as you can see in the next clip it doesn't burn for very long. This is just a little device I've made to release the gas out of the bottle. So it's a sunny day here and you can't really see the flame clearly but I can tell you it is quite strong. I used a little timber stick to make it more clear the amount of heat that's coming off. Unfortunately this is a two litre bottle at maybe two or three atmospheres of pressure but the amount of hydrogen in here is so small that it only burns for maybe 10 or 15 seconds. Storing hydrogen as a liquid is also very difficult because its boiling point is so low. And now in this slide you can see I'm characterizing the performance of my cell. So at a very low voltage the efficiency of the cell is quite high around 0.7 or almost 0.8 but the problem is that at a low voltage we don't get much power going through the cell and electrolysis is very slow. As the voltage increases the efficiency of the cell drops but we do get more hydrogen gas. There's a kind of a happy medium somewhere in the middle maybe around 40 amps or 60 amps where we've got close to 50% efficiency and a decent amount of hydrogen generation. Now there are quite a few things I could have done to improve the performance of this cell. First of all I used nickel for the electrodes. Now nickel in many ways is a very good choice because it resists the electrolyte and it doesn't dissolve into it. But there's some research which shows that stainless steel is actually more efficient as an anode for producing the oxygen gas. One thing though about stainless steel is that some people are concerned that if you submerge it in sodium hydroxide it will leach chromium or chromate into the solution and chromate is a carcinogen so we do that definitely don't want this. But it's still a topic for research we don't exactly know yet if chromate leaches into the solution. And if anybody watching this video knows the answer, I'd be very interested to hear. So please contact me somehow or make a comment below. Another thing I could have done would be add some sodium molybdate into the solution. This stops the nickel from getting passivated at the cathode. Basically, over time when it, this cell is operating, the nickel becomes less and less and less efficient. But if you add some mo sodium molybdate, it will stop that process and this is something I could still do and it will actually reverse the process. Finally, an easy way to increase the efficiency of the cell would be to change the electrolyte from sodium hydroxide to potassium hydroxide because potassium hydroxide is more conductive, it allows the electricity to pass through more easily. So thank you very much for watching, I've got a few credits I have to mention before I finish. First of all to Seamus Gallagher and Cahill McGinley who allowed me to use their tools to do this work. Couldn't have done it without them. And also the science guy who produced a really good video on this topic and it's where I got a lot of the design ideas for my cell. Thank you for watching.